When I was a little boy, I often went to the port of Copenhagen in the afternoon. I was looking at the large vessels coming in. I found them so fascinating. They were coming over from a faraway destination, stayed in port for a very short time, maybe a day, two, and then they moved further on to a new unknown destination. That was fascinating. What I didn't realize at the time was how difficult it actually is to service a vessel. It's so different from anything we know from our daily lives. A vessel is in the water, you cannot reach in the same manner. It moves around the world, it's never in the same place. When it leaves, often it never comes, comes back. You have one window to service a vessel and it's when it's in the port. And unlike many other things, if you have a problem with a car for instance, it breaks down. If it's really bad, There'll be somebody to help you, pick you up, and the car, take you to the garage, you have a nice cup of coffee, and maybe you have a rental car. It's a little bit different with the container ship with 11,000 containers on. It's not like you go in and say, oh, you know, there's a little problem, uh, here's a, we'll just lend you another vessel and uh, transfer you 11,000 containers and uh, see you back in uh, three weeks. It doesn't really work like that. And I would say, <clears throat> especially in, um, in terms of electronics, it's particularly difficult because breakdown of electronics is always unpredictable. Unlike mechanics where you can work with condition-based service. It's like, typically you will know from the tires on a car, you can measure it and you know, it goes to a certain extent, you say, oh, within the next uh, thousand kilometers you should uh, change your tires. You can't really do that with electronics. You know it will fail, you just don't know when it will fail. So the big question really is, how do you manage that? When you have a failure, what do you do about it? A vessel has a lifetime on average of 25 years. Electronic equipment on board the bridge, on average, breaks down every two to three years. So let's just say three years. That means throughout the lifetime of a vessel, you will need to attend it and service it eight times. And that's really the big challenge on board vessels today. <clears throat> then like the company I work in, we do navigation equipment. We make two products. We make voice data recorders, also known as black boxes for vessels, and then ECDIS, which is the equivalent of an electronic sea chart, replacing uh, paper, sheet, uh, paper, paper charts. We have, uh, I would say, tend to say one of the best R&D teams in this industry, in terms of software, hardware, and data communication. We have manufacturing in Thailand, and we have a worldwide service network, um, or sales and service network, which includes 400 trained and certified technicians, which can go out and do service on our products. A few years back, when I was uh, visiting our factory in Thailand, I decided really to try to understand the day-to-day -day problems which ship owners and technicians face when they go out and do service and see how what we could do to apply a solution which to the maximum extent would accommodate the problems um, there. So let me try to share with you um, the journey out there. <clears throat> so we call this a typical day for a service engineer. I was in Thailand and I asked our local service partner if I could spend a day with them. And just go out and any, any service they were doing on, uh, on board a bridge. So in this particular case, um, there's a vessel which is uh, located out on the river in, uh, in Bangkok. It has a problem with the radar. It, the radar doesn't work, consequently the vessel cannot move on. So there's only one way, to, <laughs> only one thing to do, that is to fix the radar. So, a team of four technicians from our partner company um, goes out on the vessel. It's being picked up by. Let's see, if, is there a little pointer here. Oh, that was the wrong one. Let's go ahead. That one, okay. Yeah. So it's a little vessel. Picks up us. Picks us up. So you see the four technicians here, which are going to fix it. I'm sitting in the back, and then there's uh, the guy who steers the boat. 
So luckily, as you can imagine, we got safely to the boat and also back, um, which is out here. We climbed up, and that's the first time I realized. Often it's so. I mean, when you do a service, it's 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 not often. It's not very accessible. I mean, we, we always used to either you can drive in, even with an airplane, somehow you can go into, you know, you can you can land and you can actually drive it somewhere. But here you have a vessel, and it cannot move. You have to go out there. You have to bring all your gear. You have to bring the garage to the vessel. It's very different. So we go on board. <clears throat> And then we start to look into the radar. This is the radar you see here. That's the second thing I realized. A product is not a product as we know it. It's not a little iPhone, which is a real, 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 everything is packed nicely into a little product. It's different. This is a console where you have a lot of things, print plates, uh, components, all kinds of things that's in there. And you cannot move it. It's connected to a lot of other stuff on board the vessel. So it's not like you say, oh, there's a problem, just take it and uh, um, we put another one. You know, like if it was a, a microphone. It doesn't work like that. So there's only one thing you can do, and that is to do the repair on board the vessel. There's no other option. You need to find out what the problem is and repair it before the vessel can move on. And you can say, why is it that a product looks like this? If you think about how many vessels there are in the world, we are talking roughly about 50,000 vessels, above 500 gross tons. That's a very low number. There are more cars in the center of Copenhagen than there are worldwide, uh, vessels worldwide. So that means that the cost of developing a product is very high. And therefore, you often don't really prioritize the products. You make them work and put them into a console and it works when the ship is built and when it leaves the yard. But what you don't think about is, what do you do the eight times over the ship's life, uh, vessel's lifetime when you need to service a product? And that's where you get into a situation like this. So these guys, they're working a full day, look into the manual, 700 pages. They try to fault find all kinds of things, split the whole thing off, and eventually, after the watch keeping navigator, he gets a little bit tired and falls asleep. They find out that the problem is this little fellow which they need to change. They change it, they pray, the radar works, and the vessel leaves. And we go ashore. It took four, four guys a full day. And they were lucky. So based on this, we ask ourselves, what could we do as, how could we create a concept how could we use the, the, the resources we have um, in our team? And what we decided <clears throat> was basically to say, okay, the single largest problem is the repair of the product. It's not the quality, it's not that it cannot break down, because it's impossible, it will break down. It's what do you do when it breaks down. So we said, okay, the problem is typically that you have to do the repair of the product on board the vessel. If we could find a way to remove that task, repair task, from the vessel and take that repair task to shore, we could make sure that the vessel would leave and all the problems with finding out what is the problem, how do we fix it, etc., we could do that ashore. So that's a concept we created. So let me try to take you through this. This is a typical vessel that we just saw. It comes into port, there's a problem, they request a service, maybe they get a service technician, maybe not. They find out it's not so easy to find out what the problem is. It moves on, time moves on, and it's kind of still the same situation. They don't solve the problem, and the ship is not able to leave on time. That's a classic, typical problem, and everybody's nightmare. So what we did is that we said, okay, we have a situation, we have a vessel coming in, <clears throat> There's a problem with the equipment. What do we do? Well, we have a, we have a local service network. Uh, so it's a local uh, service technician, which is trained and certified. He goes on board. And in this particular case, we say we make a product solution where we're actually able to take the unit and replace it with another one. That sounds simple, but it's not. Because if you take a black box, a voice data recorder, which is a black box, it's connected to a lot of other equipment. It's set up, it's configured, 
uh, install, configure, etc., etc. So you cannot just replace it uh, and put another one. So we had to find a way to do this and to say, okay, what we need to do is that we need to make create a technology where we will truly separate software and hardware. Truly. Normally you cannot do this. If you take a PC, it breaks down, you take out your hard disk and you replace it. You take that hard disk and you put it into another computer of the same model. It will not work. You have to reinstall everything again. So we wanted to overcome that problem and develop a type technology which we call a swap technology. It stands for software advanced protection. So it basically means that you go in in this little console, have a little unit, take out the software, replace the hardware unit, which is faulty, and then put back in the software, and then we'll be up and running. And the faulty unit, we will take it on board, and then we we'll repair that, and the vessel can move on. <coughs> you saw the picture before of how it looks. This is the unit we created. It looks like this. So this is an actual product. And the thing here which is special is actually the software, which is this part. This is all the software. So the point here is not that you can remove the software. The point is that the faulty unit, which normally you would have to repair on board, you can take a new fresh one which works, and then you can reinsert the software and it will work exactly like before. There's no change, there's no reinstallation and so forth. And the faulty unit will sell back to the factory, do fault find, uh, repair, root cause root cause analysis, and so forth. <coughs> so that's actually the um, um, that's how we overcome that. And so far in this industry, or in, in this part at least, of the um, of the bridge equipment, um, we have not seen any other solutions that accommodate that. Now. The next question then comes and say, well, that's fine. It's, um, that's great. The product works like that, but how do you make the total solution work? Because the product in itself will not do the job. So we sat down and said, okay, how can we, how can we really integrate in the solution and in our organization, in our systems, in our processes, in everything we do, the way we think, how can we integrate all this? So what we did was that we said, well, Basically, it's about three things, which we call solid, safe, and simple. We say, if we can do this, this, in practice, will work. So what does it mean? It means, first of all, that we want to make sure that, even though we know the product breaks down, we want to, we, we want to make sure that it breaks down as few times as possible. Now, <clears throat> how do we do that? There are two things. One is it has to be a nice design, obviously. But the other thing is that what makes it break down is the number of components. So the fewer components we can make, the fewer the chance, or the fewer points of failure, and the longer will be the time between the breakdowns. So what we did is that we made a product which is dedicated exactly for the specific application. What you normally do is you use a number of standard components, you bring them together, and you have a lot of things which you don't need. So we said, we'll make a product from scratch which can only do what it is intended to do and nothing else. So we minimize the number of components and consequently the breakdowns. Secondly, what often happens, what often happens is that when you have a product on board, um, you install a product, after a certain time, it becomes very, very difficult to service it. And these are the expensive, expensive products. I don't know how many of you may, if you have a PC which is close to 10 years old, but if you have, if you go down and you say, well, it doesn't work anymore, can I have it repaired? The chance is most likely very, very small. And when you make a product, which often happens in this industry, which is a combination of other things, you cannot, after a few years, it happens that you can no longer serve them. So we decided to have full control of the product and make sure that we could serve it over a 10-year period of time which the customers are happy for, uh, obviously happy about it, and we make a guarantee because they know that they will not get into a situation where they buy a product and after two years they cannot have it repaired. And coming back to that, a little bit inspired by, uh, by the previous uh, story about the case about Rolls Royce, obviously we make money in the spare parts. So, 
<coughs> the other part is um, is a service network. We have uh, we work with approximately 50 service partners worldwide, and we have a total of 400 technicians which are trained and certified by us. If they're not, they cannot touch these products by regulation. Now, it sounds very easy to have a worldwide service network, but to make it work is actually quite a challenge. Because how do we make sure that they do a good job? These are independent. We cannot really control them. They're independent service companies. So we set up what we call service commitments, which we are about to roll out to each individual technician, which we like them to commit to, understand, commit to, and if they do not, they will no longer be part of, uh, let's say, uh, they will no longer be certified by us. And that involves three things. It involves the preparation of the service, it involves the actual service, and it involves what happens afterwards. So we designed it in a way where we say we'd like to have full control, oh, not full, but maximum control of all the, the, the most important components during a product life cycle, from installation to grave. So that means there's the training itself. How do we make sure that a, a technician is well trained um, and, 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 and qualified in terms of what he's doing? So he, he goes through an initial training, which is very costly because it, all, it has to be a face-to-face -face training. He has to travel a long way or we have to tra travel a long way in order to do the training. So there's a lot of investment in it, but it only the training or let's say the certificate he gets is valid for three years. After that, he needs retraining, which is costly. So what we did is that we established an online training platform where we say, you don't need, really need to be retrained, you just want to make sure that you really know what you're doing. If he knows what he's doing, he gets a, a new certificate. If he doesn't know what he's doing, he gets into retraining. The traditional way is typically that people they attend the training and that's it. They're, they're not measured on the, quali on the qualifications, but based on participation. So we turn that around and say we want to make sure that the qualification level is, is correct. The other one is that when they install a product, we want all the data up. We basically get an uh, electronically an installation report which goes in as in, um, uh, you can call it a service ebook, where we log that on a, on a central server. <coughs> um, that means that from the very beginning we can see that the installation is done correctly and that, that's a condition for warranty to kick off. If that is not done, warranty doesn't apply. Secondly, when they go out and do service the second time, we put as a condition, as by the way, there's a, there's a, uh, it's mandatory that these products, they are um, checked on a yearly basis. It's called an annual performance test, just like you have with cars, etc. So you need, they need to be checked once a year. So we put as a condition that when a service technician goes out, first of all, he make a request and say, last time somebody was out on this vessel, were there any remarks that I need to take into consideration? So he knows that beforehand and he's prepared. We have a, 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 a service kit which he needs to take with him on board. So if there's a, let's say, the most frequent um, faults, that he can fix them on the spot. Secondly, or thirdly, um, what we do is that when we, when we receive the data, when he's finished, we receive the data, we review him, then we grade the technician. So we give him a rating from zero to five, five being the best. If he's below three, we contact him and uh, then we find out what we need to do. Um, and then the company he works for, we use these ratings as part of the overall uh, evaluation of that service company and our overall, overall relation and let's say the financial, uh, uh, it has a financial impact uh, for the service company. So everybody is very interested in, in having that, uh, that quality, quality being high. Finally, <coughs> we had a lot of considerations to say, well ideally we'd like to know every single service visit on our products on, around the world. That's an impossible task. So what we did instead is we said, well, we want the engineer if we say because we basically what is really important is that we get the information on which we will act. 
If you're not doing anything with it, it doesn't really matter. So if it's just a traditional service visit, it's nice to know, but it's not neat to know. But where it's really neat to know is if a service engineer is not fixing the problem the first time. The vessel comes into port, it's not fixed, and the vessel moves on. Now it goes into the next port, there's a new service engineer coming aboard, he doesn't fix the problem. It goes to the third port, port, a new service engineer comes on board, he doesn't fix the problem. Now the ship owner at this point, he gets a little bit irritated. The fourth time he gets really annoyed. And the fifth time he calls us and he says, you have the most crappy product and I don't want any of them on my ship anymore. And that's what we don't want. So if it's not fixed the first time, we want to know and we want to get involved to make sure that the product, uh, sorry, that the problem is solved. So we'll survey and monitor that and giving the right advice and interfere if no one else is doing it to make sure that it doesn't escalate. <clears throat> Finally, you could say what I spoke about is when you have a physical product, physical problem, you have a hardware problem, which is the most frequent, uh, frequent problem. Um, and we find, I think, a good way to solve that, or get, get around it. But sometimes it can also be other type of problems. Uh, it could be software related. It could be that on a, on a black box you have a new equipment, let's say it was a new radar installed, it's connected and recorded by the black box, but the black box is not configured correctly to the new radar. Now, that means that you need a service technician to go on board the vessel and correct the fault. It's very, very expensive. Now, if we could find a solution where you could do this remotely, which you can often do when you're onshore because you have fantastic broadband um, connections, but it's a little more difficult when you have to go via a satellite connection, which is very expensive and often not, uh, doesn't have a, 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 um, a lot of bandwidth. It's a little more complicated. But we found a way where we could have remote access to the vessel so we could get data, but we could also get access to the product and go in and do reconfiguration. Oh. So it's basically to say, we know there will be a problem, we know there will be eight problems, <laughs> and we know there will be a problem eight times over the, 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 the vessel's lifetime on average. So the software problem, we do it remotely, or we can do it remotely. If it's a hardware problem, we say, well, we basically take the problem to show and fix it there by having this swap technology which allows us to separate the software and the hardware. Then you can ask yourself the question, well, that's fine. Does it make ship owners happy? Yes, it makes ship owners happy. Does it make us happy? Well, yeah, it makes us happy. Why does it make us happy? Well, because we can make more money on it. Oh, how can we make more money on it? Well, if you go a few years back, and you ask, if Juliana was asking, oh, what's your business model? I would say it would be number one, which was the uh, asset. The asset, that was number one. So some years back, it would be number one. We made a product, got it out, yes, there's a product out in the market. Um, some ship owners, they're pretty concerned with the quality of the products. They understand it. They accept that they will maybe pay a few percentage even. We are very competitively priced. But they'll pay maybe a few percentage more compared to a product which is really not of a good quality. Because they know that the day after they buy the products and or a lifetime the total cost of ownership, that they will have a lower total cost of ownership. So that segment we have covered pretty well. But then we have another, another segment. Then we have the ship managers. They don't own the ship, they just manage the ship. And they are measured on how much money they spend 
every year. So they don't really care about the quality because maybe they have a contract for a year or two to manage a vessel. And they don't care what happens with the product after three or four years. It doesn't matter. So all that counts if the product doesn't work is how can I get the lowest price? It's all that matters. And we cannot give necessarily give the lowest price. But we say, listen, you get the total cost of ownership. Yeah, 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 but I don't, it, it doesn't matter to me. I just, just want the lowest price. It's all that matters. You say, hmm, okay. So now, if we said, we know that the total cost of ownership is, we know that we, we have the lowest total cost of ownership in the industry. So why don't we say we take that risk? Because there is no risk. We know if it fails, we know it's so easy to replace. It does not involve a lot of time, which it normally does. So we can easily take that risk and say, okay, if you want the lowest price, we give you a really, really low price. It's just one thing you need to bear in mind is that that low price, you also have to pay next year, and the year after, and the year after, and the year after, as long as your product is on board the vessel. So it basically has allowed us to create a new business model with a flat fee, much lower price each year, but over a lifetime, much higher price compared to if you do the initial investment only, but which address that really, really price sensitive um, ship manager. So that will maybe be somehow related to the model number or value proposition number three, maybe. Yeah. So that's the outcome for us. Yeah? Any questions? So they basically have to do, it's like imagine you have a car and you take it into a, um, a mandatory service and you have to check everything on the car to make sure it's right. Um, it's a little bit the same they do. So we have, we have developed a tool where, they, where we truly, uh, or not truly, but where we take them through a predefined process and say they have to check that, 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 that. So all 400 technicians, they go through exactly the same process. There's no deviation. Along that process, it, 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 um, it highlights if anything is not um, as it should be, and they have a chance to correct it. it it's, it's on a laptop, so they connect it to the, um, um, uh, to the product. Now, after that, that tool takes out all the configuration, the data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> puts it on the technician's PC, when he gets off the vessel, it's transferred and he gets an internet connection and it's transferred to us. And then we review it. So we basically have the data from the vessel of the system and go through it and see if everything is configured and set up correctly. Imagine you have um, the black box. The idea of a black box is to be able to recreate what happened or not what happened, it's to recreate the picture that was on board the vessel before an incident. So you want to see, as an example, you want to see a radar picture, what was on the radar. And that technician, a typical problem is that the radar picture is not configured correctly. So it all looks like um, fussy or whatever. That means you can't really use it. So if the technician on board is not correcting that, he's not doing his job well as an example. And then he gets a low score. When he gets a low score, he gets a feedback. We are here from headquarters, we are here to help you. 
a low score doesn't look good. And that means when we then go into a review later on with the distributor and we take all the cases into account, we basically also discuss whether we want to continue with them or not as a company. And for them it's important because they know that it's stable service fees or revenue if they service our products. It's a little more difficult than that, you can understand what you're doing in the ship side. Exactly. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Any questions for Hans or Julian? Um, I have from, 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 from Apple Smith. Smith. I have two questions. Sure. One is, how much time did it take you to redesign the black box? And the second one is, what were the major challenges you had in changing the mindset in your company from selling products? Well, the first point, we didn't completely redesign the, the, the product. We made a true, what we did is that in the next generation of product, um, it's not, in, in this industry it's not that you make a new product like every six months, you know, you have an iPhone and 5 and now you have 5S and so forth. It doesn't work like that because when you make a product, it's relatively low volume because there are not so many vessels. And they have to be type approved. So that means they live, need to live up to certain uh, regulation and you need to prove they do that. And that's very, very expensive. So you don't change your, whenever you change the product, you need to go through a new type approval, which is millions of Danish crowns. Which wouldn't be a lot in your company, but, <laughs> but in this industry it's a lot of money. Um, so what we did is that when there's a new regulation saying, well, and we knew we had to redesign the product in some one way or another, we took this into account. Having said that, fortunately, and that's why I said I think we have one of the most brilliant R&D teams in this industry, is that they made, they when they originally designed the software and the hardware platform, they took this into account. Because if you don't take that into account and you don't need to, if you've already developed a platform and then you then try to go back and say, oh, it would be nice if we could do this, it's practically impossible. You need to read a time everything. And that means all the accumulated costs you have, all your previous development you have to throw it on a whole board. I know a number of our uh, colleagues in this industry, they would love to do the same. And they've tried, but they can't. The second question was in the organization? None. No, none. No, but they love it. I mean, for, for them, it's, they all see the point. There's nobody that, I mean, there's no, there's no objection, objection to this. The challenge is different. The challenge is actually not in our company. It's in our partners, service partners company. That's why we have the challenge. Because for them, they say, oh, it's nice. Oh, there's a problem. Uh, there's a problem with the uh, with the black box. Great. Let me go on board and I'll maybe spend a day or two. And at the rate of 1,200 euros per day, sounds good. Now the alternative now is, oh, let me go on board and uh, spend 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, it's not entirely the same. Um, but then there are other financial incentives to to accommodate that. But that's the real problem. So it's not in, in, in the company. I think uh, we have a mission which basically just says that we want to make better navigation equipment. We don't want to make the most advanced, we just want to make it better. But our vision is to make um, or to have the highest customer satisfaction in the industry and on the same time, the lowest total cost of ownership. That's the two things. So, okay. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you for the presentation. I thought it was a fantastic presentation and a really great example of a product service system, a product that's designed for service as well. I'll, I'll take my own <laughs> Uh, so, so from my understanding, uh, you 
you bear the cost of the service by paying these service agents to go in. Oh, right. I might have misunderstood that. No, we don't. Uh, so, uh, because you've got a 10 year service guarantee. We guarantee that the gym is serviced 10 years. Whenever we choose to discontinue this product, we guarantee that it can be serviced for the coming 10 years. So that means if you're a ship owner and you buy a product, the normal, uh, let's say, you would not expect the lifetime of this particular product to be more than 10 years. But the problem is if you buy this product today, it's not like a PC where you just set it, because here you, you spend a lot of money on installation and cabling and configuration and all kinds of things. If you buy this today and we discontinue this product tomorrow and you have a problem service-wise or repair-wise the day after tomorrow and you cannot have it repaired, then it's not very nice for you. But that's what happens often. And the ship owner has to pay for the, the service then? He has to pay for the service. Well, that's some of the original model. Now, the, mod, the, the alternative model, which I said, the flat fee model, it would be different. He wouldn't have to pay. The guy who doesn't like to pay a lot of money, say you can pay really, a really, really, really low price. And the good part is that in that price, everything is included. You have the product, and if anything fails, it's also included. And it's a really, really low price. But the thing is, that really low price repeats itself year after year. <laughs> as opposed to if he buys the product. Just one kind of, uh, other question to that. If you're on that business model, how many times can you afford to service the product per year before it becomes unprofitable? In other words, if you're paying for the service, right. uh, so what percentage cost is that service compared to how much you're, you're gaining from uh, selling or leasing out the product? Um, let me just make sure I understand. The, the service itself, I mean, the service is two things. There's a, the, re, the repair cost of the product, and then there's the service time on board the vessel. The service time on board the vessel is not included. So it's the actual repair cost. So if you buy a product and it fails after warranty, you would need to pay for the repair of the product. Right? If you have the really, really low price, the flat fee, but which repeats itself every year, you would not pay for any repair of the product. Okay? So your question again is, in that context? How long, how long can that be profitable for you as an organization? To, to repair it? So to have like that? Yeah, let's say you have to repair it twice a year. Would you still make profits of Oh yeah, no, it's, uh, Actually, the... Uh, which I shouldn't say, but said anyway. Um, I'll just not say very loud. But the repair cost, the actual repair cost, is actually really low. But the price of the repair is actually really high. Generally speaking, we often joke with that in the, in this industry. You know that you, you know if you buy a, if you went down and you would like to buy a car, well, not take a vessel because. It's not really applicable. But if you all go down to a garage and you say, well, can I see your spare parts list? And then you would take all the parts that would constitute a car. You say, you know, I don't like to buy a finished car because as a child I was always making my own cars and airplanes and stuff. And I like to make my own cars. Well, just buy parts. So you buy parts, and if you look at the price of your car, excluding the time you have put into to assemble it, it would be something like 11 times higher than the new car. And it wouldn't prob probably wouldn't really work, but, <laughs> but that's a different story. And that goes to spare parts as well. There's a logic to it, of course, because I mean, you, you have to, to keep them in stock, etc., etc., etc. And there's always a different negotiation. If you have a product, you need the spare part, etc. But it's actually, uh, so there's a very high margin on spare parts. I think that's a really nice analogy as well, but not only for spare parts, but also for the service. Yeah.
if anybody's practical to, to answer to, to Juliana. 